Welcome to VB450 550. Very happy to have you here. I'm very happy to be here. I've been on sabbatical, so I'm getting back in the saddle, as they say. So I was very envious of people who got to teach in this classroom last year. I didn't get to do that. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy to be able to do that right now. I was uh, part of the group that helped design this classroom, and so it's really uh, kind of cool to see it come to fruition. Uh, so pretty cool. So my name's Kevin Ahern, and I will be your instructor de jour. Um, it's a, the BB450 is a class I've taught for many years. Uh, it's a class that um, I very much enjoy teaching, and um, as you will see, I'm kind of a ham, so I like to get up in front of a bunch of people. And this class certainly satisfies that need, so uh, I do that. I'll say a little bit about, in, in the beginning about um, uh, how I run things, uh, and then I want to introduce our teaching assistants and learning assistants for the uh, recitations, and I'll say a little bit about that as well. So, um, BB450 and 550 uh, is a class that I find that students have a lot of angst about. There's all kinds of urban legends out there, right? Oh my God, oh my God. I hope the urban legends are all good urban legends, but you know how people are about urban legends. They're, nobody ever says, everything's working great. Everything's wonderful, right? They don't do that because those urban legends kind of die pretty quickly, but people have all these stories about, oh my God, it's going to be awful. And I tell students that if you, you, know, you think something's going to be awful, it's going to be awful. There's no ways around that. It's going to happen. So what I try to do and what I want to do is I want to be uh, as accessible and approachable um, as I can to help you. Because I think that when you put that barrier uh, up in front of you with respect to uh, thinking something is going to be bad, you've already put a strike against yourself. Okay? So don't do that. Um, this class is a challenging class. And you'll see that I talk fast and all that sort of thing. And I don't mind if you say, hey, stupid, slow down. OK? Trust me, I don't mind that. Um, and I uh, will uh, welcome uh, and, in fact, encourage questions. So raise your hand if you have a question, if I'm not clear on something, or I mumbled something, or whatever. OK? Because um, if I don't get that from you, I don't know. I think, oh, everything's going great, right? And one of the worst things for an instructor to think is everything's going great, and it's not going great. So I want to have that, um, that feedback from you. Um, let's see. What should I say? We've got some very exciting things for BB450-550 uh, this term. In fact, there's some several new things uh, that we're doing, and I have some uh, teaching assistants uh, to thank for that. Uh, two of the graduate teaching assistants took a summer course on developing learning modules that are going to drive the um, recitations. And so you'll see about that starting in recitation next week. I already had somebody came by uh, the office this morning and said, oh, my recitation TI isn't there. I did put a message out yesterday to everybody saying no recitations. Did everybody get that? No. Nobody got that. You know, it's odd. I've had some very odd problems with Canvas. When I send messages out through Canvas, I'm getting them, but I'm getting the sense that people out here aren't getting them. So you haven't gotten any messages from me at all? Well, you're not going to see it on Canvas, because I don't do it on Canvas. All right? But you should have gotten an email from me from Canvas. You haven't gotten that. OK. All right, well, that's why nobody's downloaded the book then. So we're using a free textbook for the first time. That's also brand new. Uh, you wanted to buy a book for this course, all right? That was what I did on my sabbatical. How I spent my summer vacation, or actually how I spent my whole sabbatical year, was writing a book. And so I've been a little puzzled because I sent this message out, and it's gone out, and I get it in my mailbox. And then I look at the downloads that's happening with the book, and the numbers haven't gone up. And I thought, well, maybe they're all waiting until the day of class to download the book, which would be kind of unusual. Um, I will check on that. How many people actually have downloaded the book? A few, few people contacted me. Wow, OK. <laughs> it's going to be a big download <laughs> group today, I can tell you that. All right, I will check on what's happening with Canvas email. And I, I, I appreciate uh, your letting me know that. All right, so anyway, we've got a, a brand new book. I've written a book. Uh, it's a free download. Um, it's designed for an iPad slash Mac. It's also, there's also a PDF version for people who don't have either of those systems. Um, it's a big book, all right? But the good thing is it's got big print and all that sort of stuff, so it might seem like it's longer than it really is. It's not quite as long as you might think. All right. 
So anyway, that's enough about the book. We'll talk more about that as I get going along. But I do want to say something about the TAs and the recitations, because that's, I've asked the TAs and the learning assistants to come uh, and talk about that today. So um, the, um, as I said, the, the uh, recitations will all uh, be driven by the learning modules that have been designed by two graduate students. And I'd like to ask them to stand up first. And that's Kelsey Keene and Chelsea Holman. Uh, these two students put a lot of time in this summer uh, designing, look at that, designing uh, the uh, modules that you're going to use. Um, we think it's a very, very good approach to learning biochemistry. And not only do we have teaching assistants this year, but for the first time we've also um, hired learning assistants. So if I could ask all the teaching assistants and learning assistants to stand up, I'll try to get everybody's name right and um, I'll introduce them. So Elise right here, uh, one, of the, one of the teaching assistants. Blake, a learning assistant uh, right here. Isabel, uh, one of our teaching assistants here. Uh, back over here, I've got Elliot, uh, one of the student learning assistants. I've got Ariana here. I've got Mariah here. And who else do I see? Anybody else I missed? We have more than just the ones that are here, but not everybody could be here. So these are the folks who will be helping you. I keep bumping that. But these are the folks who will be helping you in recitation. I will say, first of all, the recitation attendance is expected. That is, recitation will be 5% of your grade, and your grade will be partly, mostly based on attendance. If you don't come to recitation, you will not get that 5%. All right, so it's important that you come to recitation. All right, uh, thank you all. You can all sit down if you haven't done that. All right, um, that's the prepared remarks that I have. Now it's the unprepared remarks that you always have to look out for. So, um, what did you guys do this summer? Working good. Classes, I heard. Any exciting vacations? Nobody's going to raise their hands. You know, I went to, <laughs> had a great vacation. Everybody else was working, right? Yeah, I had a pretty much a working summer myself. I usually like to take a nice vacation, but this, year, this summer I was scrambling to get the book done because I knew I had to get everything done before uh, classes got started. Otherwise, I'd be in real trouble, even bigger trouble than not getting the messages out through Canvas. Uh, OK. Um, Anyway, so that's kind of how I spent my summer vacation and how uh, I'm looking forward to the new year. We'll have some adjustments with things, I will tell you, with a new book. Uh, we'll have some adjustments with new recitations and so forth. And so again, your feedback is helpful. Um, if you find things are working or if things aren't working, we like to hear either way uh, because that helps us to adjust and to, um, if we're doing something great, then we know not to change it. Uh, and if we're not doing something great, then we do uh, adapt as appropriate. So we'll see a little bit of things happening with that. The students watching on the video uh, will um, get this uh, for the eCampus next term. So on the eCampus, they're still, still doing the old videos from previous, and they're using the uh, uh, Strider book. Uh, when they see this video, of course, they'll be watching uh, and doing the, the new book uh, as well. So that's. Uh, a big thing for, for the students. Now you see I have a camera set up right over here. Um, I will set up a camera every uh, class and videotape and I will put on the class web page, which you should have gotten an email about, but you didn't, um, the um, a video each day. So you'll see the video that I've uh, prepared for that and you can think, okay, I don't have to go to class anymore and you don't. But I can tell you that those who do Grades, I've compared. I actually have measured this, folks. The grades are incredibly different between those who show and those who don't show. And those who say, oh, I don't have to go to class anymore. I just watch the videos, which is the most common thing that I hear. The difference in grades is about two letter grades. So if you use the videos the way I hope that you use them, that is, A, I've got a death in the family. I can't be there, and I'm going to catch up with it that way, or some emergency that happens, that's probably the best way to use it. You can use it if I want to review and listen to what he had to say, right? And get all that down, or ask questions, or make sure you understood something. But if your idea is, I don't have to go to class because there's a video out there, your grade's going to drop two letter grades. That's, that's literally what happens. OK? Have I scared you? Everybody got that? OK. So um, I also say that if it gets really bad, and I look out here and I see very few faces, then the videos stop. So the video is there as a backup, and the video is there to help you enhance your learning. But if people decide that that's not what I'm going to come, I don't have to come to class anymore, and that's a, a pretty widespread notion, then the videos will stop. And there's no telling when that happens. 
We do sometimes have technical problems, so you can't always count the video always being there. I can't guarantee it will always be there, but I do as best I can. Okay, well, um, it's about 10 after 12. Should we dive in? Anybody have any comments? If you don't open your mouths, I'm going to start throwing things at you uh, with, that you're going to have to know. And so the more questions you ask me at this point, the less you have to know. We haven't started into the material yet. Nobody wants to do that. Everybody's dying to get in and learn biochemistry. Yeah? What's the difference between 450 and 550? The difference between 450 and 550 is one of expectation. Okay? The grades are determined by the students uh, in the 450 class. Uh, 550 students are held to a higher standard in the grading. I look over uh, more closely the grading on all the students taking the 550 class. So the expectation is that because you're a graduate student, you should be performing at a higher level than the, uh, than the undergrads are doing. So that's an expectation with respect to grading. But good question. Thank you. Yeah? My book is the only text. Yeah. So, so the book, Berg is, uh, if you look in the, in the bookstore, it's optional. It's an optional, it's an optional book. And you can certainly, and there are plenty of books that you can, you can use. I don't have any you know, fantasy that my book is the best book in the world. I don't mean to say that. Uh, so you can use any book that you want to with it. I think what all, it's a good question. I think what all of you will, I think what all of you will see uh, is that I'm going to put a lot of stuff out there on the web for you. And one of the guidelines I have for learning the material is what I say in class is numero uno. Okay? You're going to see a lot of things in the book, even in the assigned pages that I put in the book, that I'm not going to talk about. Am I going to hold you responsible for those? The answer is no. So what I talk about in class is what you're responsible for. Okay? The book is there to enhance your knowledge, expand your knowledge, and that's true of any book, whether that's Berg or whether that's Leninger or whether that's uh, uh, Matthews and Van Hole, okay? or my book. But any, any book that's there is going to have things that I'm not going to talk about. So they're there to help you to learn the material or to help expand your knowledge, or give you a different perspective. All of those are important. Okay? But it's not there uh, to just say, oh boy, I can really stick it to him now. I got all these things on here that I can ask him about. Right? So I'm not going to do that. All right? I really believe in, as much as I can in being fair in asking you questions and in expectations I have of you. I really think that's very important for a professor to do that. I do not ask questions to trick you. I can assure you. It doesn't mean to say people don't get tricked. I <laughs> just don't ask questions to trick you. I think it's a stupid way for a professor to behave. All right? So um, if you don't like a question on an exam, I'm always happy to hear from you. I don't take it personally. Okay? Come talk to me. Um, and I would encourage you to come talk to me uh, anytime. So always, my, people say, what's your office hours? My office hours are when I'm not in class. I'm in my office. Come see me. That's it. Okay. So if I'm not in the meeting, I shouldn't say you're not in class. I'm not in a class. I'm not in a meeting. I'm in my office. So you're always welcome there. You don't have to make an appointment to see me. If you want to make an appointment, I'm happy to make sure I'll be there at that time. But you're always welcome to just drop by. Always welcome to that. Other comments? Yeah. What's that? Is there online homework? So I have some problems that I have written online that students can uh, work to help learn the material, but there's nothing that you turn in. So there's nothing that you turn in. Uh, the, the TAs will have, as part of the learning modules, something that you will turn in with them. Uh, and that's the recitations. But in terms of the class, there's nothing to turn in here. Go ahead. Go ahead. There's the world. The world keeps popping up on us. OK. Other comments, questions? Uh, we will have them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's actually on the web page. Uh, so you guys are all going to get an email from me uh, later today uh, with all that information. So uh, midterms or in finals, I don't remember the dates off the top of my head. Yes. Where's my office? That's also on the email you're going to get. I'm in ALS 2145. Nobody knows anything. It's, I've never had a class that never got an email from me. That's kind of odd. And I've been using Canvas for several years. I don't know what happened with it. Maybe they tweaked something. ALS 2145. ALS is the building immediately north of this building. OK? Please come see me. I'd love to meet you. love to talk to you. Chelsea. Are there going to be recitations in the evening? 
Are there going to be recitations the week of Thanksgiving? You guys all want to meet Thanksgiving week, right? You want extra credit? Everybody wants extra credit, right? <laughs> so if I say, if I say extra credit, if I say, do you have to, do I want you to do something? You'll say, no, I don't want to do this. But if I say extra credit, everybody's face lights up. I want extra credit. <laughs> no, there will not be recitations the week of Thanksgiving. Is everybody happy now? I can't give you extra credit because, you know, well, if you have a recitation on Tuesday, okay, I'll get extra credit. And the people on Thursday going, what the? <laughs> right? I'm coming in on Turkey Day to get my extra credit, right? Okay. So, no, there's no extra credit. Uh, and the only time there's ever extra credit in the class uh, is if there's about four people sitting in the audience, in which case they're all going to get extra credit, right? So if I have a bad day of attendance, then I would, I would do that. But generally, people in this class are pretty good about coming to class. So you guys are seniors for the most, juniors and seniors for the most part now. I don't have to be your mother and nag you and tell you it's important to go to class, right? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. How aligned is my course to the MCAT? Well, um, I would say my course is very well aligned uh, to the MCAT. Um, I'll brag for a moment. Um, we, they, they did a, an exam of students taking my class, uh, it's been several years ago now, um, of a standardized biochem exam that was aligned, it was exactly aligned with the MCAT, but very much in line with that. And students taking this class scored, I, I'm very proud of this, I, I thank the students, 13% higher than the national average uh, on that. So I think we're aligned pretty well with that. Um, I'm, an, I'm a, a, a um, pre-med advisor. I work with students a lot on strategies of getting into medical school. Um, I have a free book that I've written about how to get into medical school. When you go to download the book for this class, you'll also see that free book for medical school called Kevin and Indira's Guide to Getting Into Medical School. I strongly encourage you, if you're a pre-med or a pre-dental or pre-pharmacy, pre, if you have a pre somewhere there, this will have useful information for you. Um, and so um, get that. And of course, if I can be of help to you, I'm always happy to help you as well. So come see me. You get a short, simple question, you get a long answer. Did I see another hand? OK, so the last thing I'll say before I dive into this is I'm doing something new myself here the first time, besides being up here on this, this circular thing. One of the things you learn teaching in a circular environment is there's always somebody looking at your butt. So that's why you keep moving, right? Imagine, you know, okay, I always, when I did help people design this room, I said, you know, what you're going to have is you're going to have a certain number of people. They're going to sit here and they're going to lecture like this. And everybody that's sitting back there, the whole view they're going to have of you the whole term is not a pretty one, okay? So you've got to learn to walk around and, and do all the things that uh, are necessary to make eye contact and so forth. Anyway, that's not the only thing that's new. The new thing for me is I'm actually using presentation software. You might think of it as PowerPoint. I use something called Keynote. Um, I've never done that before. I hate presentation software. I really hate it because it's very linear. This slide leads to this slide, leads to this slide. If I go backwards, I have one slide to move. I've always taught the class using HTML where I can click on links and move at whatever pace I want to. That turned out not to be very practical in this room, unfortunately. So I'm learning something myself. So hopefully I'm giving you um, intelligently organized things as I'm going through my lectures. Okay. The last thing I'll say is we ha I keep saying the last thing. The last thing I'll say is uh, we'll have some fun too. And uh, we, I, I like music, and you'll see some music at the end of each lecture. So that's something that'll be fun. Okay. Is that a hand up or is that just holding your pen? Okay. All right. Are we set? All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm hoping to do it as soon as I get back to my office and find out what the problem is. I, I don't know what the problem is. That's first, uh, first, I have heard that there is a problem. But I, will, I, I can assure you it will be the first thing I do after class. And um, yeah, so I don't know what the problem has been. OK. Yeah. Yeah, so a tentative class schedule is coming on the class page. It's all there. So the whole class schedule, all the exam dates and so forth, that's all on the class page. Uh, that I'll send out. I just, I, I, I didn't, nobody told me it wasn't, they weren't getting the, of course, <laughs> raise your hand if you're not here, right? Nobody says I'm not getting the messages, right? So I didn't know that you just hadn't got the message, but I'll, but I'll, I'll make sure it's there. But there's a whole bunch of stuff there. There's problems there. There's the presentations are all there. So all the presentations I'm going to give, 
Um, I'll be loading those as we go through the term. There's about five of them right there right now. Uh, and I'll be uploading them as we go further along. OK? Yeah. Yeah? What's my testing format? That's a good question. Um, I have a sample exam that I put um, on the class page. And you can download that and see. And I'll have you do that rather than me answer that question here. But I will tell you something about exams that I think students screw up on a lot. And that is that they rely on old exams way too much. Everybody wants old exams. And you're welcome to do them. But what I find happens with students is they use old exams as study material. And that's the dumbest possible thing that anybody can do. Old exams should be used to learn the format of the exam. So that's why I provide one old exam so that you can see the format. You won't be surprised about the way things are laid out. There's short answer, there's longer answer, kind of like problem things, and there's uh, one other short section as well. So there's usually three sections to my exams. So familiarizing yourself with that format is good, but looking, oh, did I get this one right? Did I not get that one right? And I will tell you in advance, if you want me to be rude, I don't like to be rude, but if you want me to be rude, come ask me something off of an old exam. Because I will tell you what I'm telling you right here. This is not the way of study. I talk about different things, different terms. I'm not going to waste my time answering a question about something I haven't talked about here, right? So you should be studying the material. That's the most important thing that you can do. Because I think where students think that professors trick them, here's what happens. They study old exams. And wording changes. But they've learned a pattern from the old exams. And what do they put down without thinking when they answer a question on, the old ex on a new exam? what the answer was to the old exam. And then they discover it's not right. The professor is trying to trick me, right? No, not necessarily, right? You were answering according to patterns instead of using this thing up here. Use this thing up here. So that's why I try to get students away from old exams. You will only see one old exam for me, and that's on the web page. All the other exams will have the same format, OK? OK, well, I guess I've rambled on long enough, about halfway into the class. So now let's dive in. Um, today, I'm just going to introduce the subject uh, of biochemistry. And we think about biochemistry, we think about life. And of course, that's the root of biochemistry, because bio part uh, is that. Biochemistry had its roots in the chemistry of living cells. Right? And life is fascinating. Everywhere we look on, the, on our planet, we see life. We see life in ponds. right? We see life on farms. We see life in the ocean. We even see life up in the clouds. This is kind of a cool thing. This, this summer, somebody published a really cool paper okay, where they had gone into Montana. And this farmer said that when they had this, this one uh, downpour that had happened, his crops all got this one fungus that they, they wouldn't have other, he didn't think they ever otherwise would have gotten. And somebody had the idea that, well, well maybe, of course, it fell out of the sky with the, the rain and so forth. And of course, no surprise, there's microbes floating in the air and so forth. But they did some investigating, and they found that, in many cases, the microbes were actually nucleation events for raindrops that were falling. And so if you had, let's say, a drought, and you had a fungus in one part uh, of the, the country that was growing because of this drought, when that drought came and it got blown up into the atmosphere, what happened? Those nucleation events were bringing this fungus down this, this farmer's farm. Life is everywhere. We can't escape life. Pretty amazing. We think about life, and we think about the study of life. And I like to think about this a little bit historically. I say the visual perspectives. We started learning about life as a result of dissections. That was one of the first real investigations people did trying to get at what was life. That's the question. What is life? We still ask the question today. What is life? All right? The dissections that we, people focus on, it's kind of a grotesque image, isn't it? The, the, uh, the dissections that people focused on, OK? help them to understand, well, what is it to be alive? What does it mean to be alive? We look at an organism, and we think of an organism. Is the organism the fundamental unit of life? It's not. And they thought, well, maybe the tissue is the fundamental. What is life? What is death, right? Is it the tissue? Is the tissue the fundamental unit of life? Muscle, bone, people are made of those things. They're the building blocks of us. Are they the fundamental units of life? And of course, they weren't. And they couldn't answer that question because they didn't understand really much more of what was out there. 
There were philosophical views people had of what is life. We have a lot of philosophical views today of what is life. But the philosophical perspectives of what is life dominated the study of life. Okay? They dominated the study of life. The person pictured on the screen is a, an incredible man named Friedrich Wohler. And Friedrich Wohler helped put to rest one of the most biggest misconceptions people had about life. The belief prior to Friedrich Wohler, he was, a, he was an organic chemist, the, the belief prior to Friedrich Wohler's work was that the only way that anything biological came about was as a result of action of an organism. And what does that mean? Well, we see, for example, what Wohler did. Wohler was able to take a test tube, and in a test tube, independent of any cell, he was able to synthesize the compound urea, the stuff that makes your pee smell. Okay? And prior to his experiment, nobody had ever been able to make, in a laboratory, a biological molecule. If you couldn't make it, it must be magic. It must be coming from a vital life force. And Wohler, in one experiment, demolished that. Okay? He absolutely demolished that notion. And so we began to realize that the chemical reactions that happen inside of cells a, aren't magical, and we'll talk about things that seem magical later in the term. They're not magical. And B, okay, there's something that follows the rules of everything else in the universe. And I'll come back to that numerous times during the term. There's no difference between what happens in a cell and what happens outside of a cell other than the fact that it's in a cell. Cells follow the rules of the universe. They exist in the universe. They have no other... Uh, hope to do that. Okay. Well, technology played a very big role, as I'll show you in a minute, uh, within our understanding of life. But what really happened was the move for understanding that life came about as a result of, of molecules. So the more modern views of life, we think of the organization, and everybody who's taken a biology class has seen uh, the organization from top down to bottom. Um, of living organisms on the face of the planet. And we can break down every organism according to these uh, organizational schemes, both on a, uh, an anatomical basis as well as on a molecular basis. And that's one of the really exciting things that's happened uh, for us. Today, a more modern view of what I just showed you is actually the evolutionary history of organisms that we see here. And we know this evolutionary history is a result of uh, action of people doing molecular analysis of cells that I won't go into here. But if we go back a ways, we realize that the importance of technology happened when the first microscope got invented. Several people are actually credited with that. One of the people who did the, some of the most important work was Van Leeuwenhoek. And he studied and saw, looking in his microscope, things he called animalcules. These animalcules turned out to be cells. And prior to the microscope, we had no understanding that cells existed and we had no understanding from a biological perspective that the cell was the fundamental unit of life. Now, we'll see that there's subcellular components that are actually important contributors to that, but the cell was the fundamental unit of life. In the 1800s, this person here, Friedrich Meischer, isolated a compound that nobody paid any attention to for about 50 or 60 years. And his discovery had to later be sort of uncovered to realize what he had discovered. He discovered a compound he called nuclein that he got from the sperm of salmon. And this nuclein seemed to be everywhere, and that's what he called it. And we know it today, of course, as DNA. Mendel was critical in helping us to understand inheritance. And inheritance, of course, is how genetic traits are passed or phenotypic traits are fat passed from one organism to another. We know genetically, of course, how that happens. And we know how uh, that there's a relationship between genes okay, and the proteins that we'll be spending a fair amount of the term uh, talking about. This person on the uh, screen here, Erwin Schrodinger, also known for his work in physical chemistry, made a very important contribution in the 1930s. And he wrote a very influential uh, book. His book focused on something that, amazingly enough, prior to that time, people had not focused on, and that was the
the molecular basis of life. This is before we knew the structure of DNA, before we knew the role of RNA and proteins and so forth. Schrodinger said, you know, the cell is the fundamental unit of life. But I think, but I, but I have cells that are over here and I have cells that are over here and they're different cells. Why are they different? There's got to be something besides the magic of the cells that makes them different. There's got to be something that makes a dog different than a human besides the fact that they're different types of cells. Where does that smallest unit come from? And so Schrodinger's idea was that there was a molecular basis of life. He wrote a book about it. And his idea was that everything that we see in biology, whether it's uh, phenotypic traits relating to hair loss, which I can relate to. Yeah, I heard a good laugh on that one, right? Uh, or, it's okay to laugh at my lack of hair. I laugh at it too. Uh, I wish I had more. If there's one genetic experiment I would like to do, <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be pouring it right here, you know? <laughs> Nothing worse than going out in the sun. And it, I always wear a hat because if I go out literally for five minutes in the sun, I got a sunburn up there. Yeah, anyway, okay. Oh, it's that story. <laughs> okay. Um, everything, every phenotypic trait had its roots in molecules. And that was what gave birth to what we think of today without even thinking about it as molecular biology. That's where that term came from. All of the roots of biology are in molecules. And today, of course, we know that's the case. Imagine coming up with that before you knew what DNA, what the structure of DNA was. How information was passed from cell to cell, the role of proteins relative to DNA. Pretty remarkable thing, okay? And he doesn't get enough credit for that idea that he had. There were experiments that were done in the 1940s, uh, for example, that convinced everybody that DNA was the genetic material. When I say genetic material, meaning it has the information necessary to make a cell. Avery McLeod McCarty did a very clever experiment that I won't go through uh, with you here, but they did a very clever experiment that demonstrated without hardly anybody's doubt that DNA was the genetic material. Well, if DNA wasn't the genetic material, what did people think it was? Most people thought that proteins were the genetic material because every time you looked in cells, you found proteins everywhere. And we knew proteins did things. We knew proteins catalyzed reactions. They're the magical part of stuff, right? They envisioned that proteins were, in fact, the genetic material. And Avery McLeod McCarty's experiment demonstrated clearly in the 1940s that DNA was the genetic material. And then the race began, of course, to determine the structure of DNA, and you know a lot of the story of that. Watson and Crick get a lot of credit and deserve a lot of credit for determining the structure of DNA, but I like to give credit uh, to Rosalind Franklin, um, who basically had the data that Watson and Crick stole, and they admitted they stole it, to publish the structure of DNA. We should be talking about Watson, Crick, and Franklin in crediting that, because Rosalind Franklin was a phenomenal biophysicist who had information about the fact that DNA was a helix. She was the first person really to uh, establish that. Linus Pauling thought it was a helix, but she had the data that showed that it was. What Watson and Crick gave us as a result of the structure of DNA was the idea of complementarity. You want to underline one thing, complementarity is it. Complementarity, of course, allows information in one strand of DNA to code for the information in the other strand. And as a result of that, information can be passed from one cell to the next cell by simply copying the DNA and passing the new molecule of DNA into the new cell. Okay? Complementarity was pretty remarkable. Complementarity discovered because we knew the structure of DNA. Everybody, every school kid today knows that G pairs with C, A pairs with T. And we'll talk a lot more about those um, more next term than we will this term. We'll talk a little bit about it this term. We know the central dogma. The central dogma, of course, in very simple terms. DNA makes RNA, makes protein. That's what the central dogma is. The central dogma simply states the rules by which uh, the uh, cells do what they do. DNA makes RNA, makes protein. 
Very, very simple. The central dogma wasn't known at the time the structure of DNA was determined. The central dogma was later determined. It wasn't immediately clear what RNA was doing when the structure of DNA was discovered. Okay. We think about cell biology. We think about cells. What are cells, right? Autotrophs versus heterotrophs. There's a lot of, a lot of cells out there. Be a great bumper sticker, right? There's a lot of cells out there. Cells happen, right? No, they don't. They actually derive from other cells. But the point is that there are certain cells that make their own materials. We think about, of course, plants with photosynthesis, making all the things that they need. Give them a carbon source, give them a nitrogen source, and they're pretty happy. Bacteria can do that. Others use molecules made by other cells. Those are heterotrophs. We are a heterotroph. We eat plants. We eat animals. We even eat bacteria. We drink the beer, right? One of the best parts of being a heterotroph. OK, I, I found this video day before yesterday. How many, how many people heard of the tardigrade? OK, this is an amazing organism. We think about the diversity of life. Look at this guy. Got eight legs, microscopic. Got this lovely head with this thing sticking out, grabbing food. This organism is probably the best example anybody has of the incredible ability of organisms to live almost anywhere. This guy right here can live okay, in the complete vacuum of space, can live under conditions of x-rays that would kill every other organism on the face of the Earth, can live desiccated for up to 30 years, desiccated meaning absolutely zero water. How in the world does it do it? Well, the reason this guy was in the news uh, this week was that they discovered he, has a pro he or she has a protein that protects the DNA better than any other cell has. Organisms have evolved incredible abilities to fill in the niches that are available to them. And the tardigrade is a great example of that. In this class, we'll talk about three groups of organisms. And primarily, I'll talk about two. The two I'll mostly talk about are prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes being single cell bacteria. Eukaryotes being some single cell, some multiple, multiple cells. We're, we are a eukaryote. Animals, plants. Yeast is a eukaryote. We'll see why there's a difference with that in just a bit. And we'll talk a little bit, not very much, but a little bit about a third group of organisms called the Archaeans. Archaeans were originally discovered as being able to grow in very, very inhospitable environments. This is uh, an acid leach mine. And that's one of the places where they could find Archaeans growing. And at first, it was thought the Archaeans were simply able to find, fill in this very difficult niche that they, of, of, of bad environments. But now we know Archaeans are actually quite a bit more widespread than that. Archaeans are more closely related to bacteria. Well, they're partly related to, uh, to eukaryotes, but we think of them more as bacteria because they're single cell. Okay. How do we distinguish a prokaryote and a eukaryote? Well, we can't distinguish it on the basis of being single-celled versus multi-celled, because some eukaryotes are single-celled and some are multi-celled. Yeast are single-celled or eukaryotes. The distinction actually happens not by their cellularity, but rather by the, uh, their organelles. Eukaryotes have organelles. Bacteria basically don't. Okay. Eukaryotes have a nucleus. It's where the DNA and RNA are found. Eukaryotes have a mitochondrion, the power plant of the cell that we'll talk a lot about next term. Eukaryotes, if they're a plant, have a chloroplast, which is where photosynthesis occurs. Eukaryotes have an endoplasmic reticulum. They have a variety of things. Prokaryotes, we think of as a bag of enzymes because they don't have organelles. They don't have substructures within there. This structure called a nucleoid isn't a nucleus. It isn't anything separate from the rest of the cell. The prokaryotes, the bacteria, are largely bags of enzymes because they have a cell wall. And basically, everything else is a soup that's mixed up inside of them. Prokaryotic cells are much smaller than eukaryotic cells in general. Eukaryotic cells are probably about, oh, 100 to 1,000 times larger. Still pretty small, but, but prokaryotes are even smaller. Okay, there are some distinctions for you there. You can see the sort of summary of what I've told you here. And I love this picture. Oh, this thing is too sensitive. You know people that are too sensitive? I'm too sensitive. There we go. My clicker is too sensitive. There we go. 
That's why I hate presentation software. How many times are you with a professor, you're sitting there, and it's like, clack, 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 you know, it's going, God, give me a break. Okay. Anyway, it's a beautiful uh, illustration of a eukaryotic cell. You can see those organelles in a little bit more realistic way. They actually appear in a cell instead of those cartoon uh, features that I showed you uh, earlier. You can see some other things there, like the, the Golgi apparatus and vesicles and centrosome and so forth. Um, but again, eukaryotic cells have these substructures uh, within them. They're bigger, so they have room for these things as well. We look at the DNA in a, in a eukaryotic cell. It's a heck of a lot bigger than a prokaryotic cell. On average, about a thousand times more, and there's quite a bit of variation in that, but if we think about a thousand times more DNA in a eukaryotic cell, we've got a pretty good estimate uh, of that. Cells have skeletons. You've learned this in cell biology, I hope, and if you haven't had cell biology, I'm telling you maybe for the first time, but cells have skeletons. It's called a cytoskeleton. We'll talk a little bit about them, microtubules, filaments, and so forth that are present in them. And you can see that these have been stained. We're actually looking inside of a cell there at some of the uh, cytoskeletal components uh, of a cell, the nucleus in the center uh, of each one in blue. Okay, so if we look at a eukaryotic organism, we see four types of tissue. Tissues are important, obviously. There's four types of tissues. Epithelial tissue, <coughs> connective tissue, and want to fill in the other two for me? What's that? Muscle and nerve. So the four types of tissue right there. Okay. Well, um, we're near the end. I like to write verses. And so I was inspired to write a verse uh, about bacteria. So please excuse me while I give you my verse. Excuse me for feeling superior to all the lowly bacteria. You should know very well there is no organelle inside of their tiny interior. Okay, weak effort. All right. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Don't give me your sympathy, folks. I will, it'll get worse, I'll, I promise. So, all right. But as I said, we like to, I like to finish on a happy note. We're going to finish on a happy note. How many people have heard of the metabolic melodies? Okay, we're going to have metabolic melodies at the end of every class. We have a brand new one today that I've never done in class. And I tell my students the following about melodies. The louder you sing, the more likely you will have an extra credit on the first exam. Is that a deal? All right. The words will be up on the screen. Somebody will be singing it, not me. And this one is called Biochem is Beautiful. First time ever done in BB450. Here we go. All the jewels with all of structures they possess proteins fat and dna's there must be a million ways to evaluate our knowledge for the test biochem is beautiful our professor says the sugar in ourselves to actions of HDLs, and we'll talk about those. <laughs> Molecules are dutiful in every way. Substrates for the enzymes are converted every day. Oh, <laughs> there is no enzyme. Lower delta G. They just work all the time on transition energy. This is provides the cells metabolic jump start and I gotta get that volume higher. They all capitalize the given rise to reactions between the carbons. Biochem is beautiful, saying it with zest. Would be so much easier if I could just ace the test. And you will! Biochem is beautiful, saying it with zest. Would be 
be so much easier if I could just ace the test. Okay, we have enough time. I have one more. I'm going to turn the volume up for that one, so bear with me for a second. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's try that. Okay, the other one, to the tune of Oh Christmas Tree. Are we set? I wish that I were 